you know, method to do it. They shut they down. Shut One again. of them shuts down. No. No. no they they shut down. And try again. A random period. Yes, it's a random back off you know mechanism. So each you know Nick will throw a dice, okay, and say, okay, I'm gonna wait you know three seconds, and then the other you know, Nick will say, okay, I'm flipping a, you know I'm throwing my own dice, and I'll wait you know, three seconds. Okay, one is waiting three seconds, the other one is waiting five seconds. So now the problem is resolved, right? But it has a big problem because you know as you increase the number of uh, NICs on you know, connecting to the same hub, the chances of having a collision or a bus fight is not increasing linearly. Okay, as you add more and more NICs to it, it goes like like that. Okay, and also as the num as the traffic gets more and more heavy, um, if you Okay, let's say you know your um, the bandwidth, the you know, collective bandwidth, is going from is doubling. Okay, you know, it's going from two uh, gigabits per second. Uh, okay, let's scale back. Let's say it's going from two megabytes per second to four megabytes per second. You know, collectively. Okay, they want to you know, move data. You know, in that rate, uh, the chances of collision is not linear either. Okay, it really is. I think it's the square. I can be wrong too. Yeah, you know, but it's at least super linear to the. Uh, to the bandwidth that is needed. So that means you know, the most, when you need to resolve fights the most, the fights happens even more often. Okay? Because the random back off mechanism can only help you so much. Um, and that's why Ethernet you know, is not a very good mechanism when you want, one, efficient use of the bus, and two, predictable time of when a packet can be sent because of the random back off mechanism, and you also don't know when the next time you try, whether it will have a collision or not. So it becomes a very unpredictable kind of thing, and that's why we have token rain and many, many other types of networking mechanism and topology to basically get around this problem. The question is, why, do we, why are we still using ethernet today when we have all these problems? Well, I think it has to do with a particular computer um, or a particular vendor using it, and then it finally got a lot more popular than token rain and the competing in the standards, which many of those are superior. It's kind of like VHS versus beta again. Okay, which one won? VHS. VHS, right? You know, but which one is a, was a was a better standard? Beta. It was beta. Yep, it's the same thing here. And here's another little trivia mm -hmm. that you know, I want digressing more and more, but I can see you guys are starting to you know, wake up again. Um, who invented Ethernet? Company, it's an it's a organization. Was it the Xerox? Yes, it is Xerox, the copying machine company. You know, they invented just about everything that we use today. The graphical user interface, the concept of a mouse, uh, Ethernet, just to name a few of them. Windows. Yeah, Windows was derived from the graphical user interface you know, thing. Um, so the question is, you know, why do we even have the PARC, P-A-R-C, Palo Alto Research Center, when Xerox was, for the most part, an East, to East Coast company? Nobody knows. Nobody cares. <laughs> You should probably know because you know this is a history of you know what happens to uh, people who are really bright, creative, and you know hardworking, working for a company who did not appreciate it. <laughs> okay, so Xerox, as an East Coast company, recruited a lot of these you know, really bright, you know, innovative, creative, and hardworking you know engineers who came up with all these different bright ideas and pester their you know supervisor to no end. It's like, boss, look. I got a really great idea of networking Ethernet, right? Or boss, I got a really good idea of how people should use their copiers. You know, you know, it's not computers, it's copier, right? The graphical user interface. And boss, I have a great way so that people can move this little thing here, and that little thing on the screen will move with it. Wow, you know, don't you feel excited? No, not really. Can you make that copier go faster? Okay, so eventually, I think, and this is just my uh, thinking, so I think eventually a lot of these people got disgruntled and became you know, a source of disruption to the company. So you know, Xerox finally you know, formed you know, the PARC, you know, P-A-R-C, you know, in the West Coast. 
as a containment facility for all these creative <laughs> people with all these you know, bright ideas but got nowhere to go. They don't want to fire these people because just in case we want to make our copiers twice as fast again, we might need their help. Okay, So I don't want to lose these people, but at the same time, I don't want to deal with all these bright ideas every day, you know, hour by hour, they got all these, you know, crazy ideas, okay? So they, they, they just you know, put them in Palo Alto, and give them all the computers and all the toys they want, and just say, when we need, when we need you, we'll call you, okay? Meanwhile, just play with all these, to all these toys, right? So they played with all these toys, and they came up with you know, the graphical user interface, the mouse, you know, Ethernet, and many, many other great ideas, and got nowhere else to go, right? Nobody is, still nobody was appreciating their designs, you know, their innovation and stuff like that. So they went to the local computer meet, right? You know, with all the you know, classic geeks like you know, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak and stuff like that. And then they just kept telling those people, you have to come to our facility. We got all these cool stuff to show you. And of course, you know, back then, you know, all these geeks got nothing else to do and just say, well, sure, we'll go, you know, take a look at your stuff. And you know, the rest is history. So I need you guys to know about these stories, especially those of you who are you know, particularly creative, bright, and um, you know, like to innovate and create new stuff. You know, who you work for is really important. Because if you're creative and your employer doesn't like it and keep you know, telling you to brush the, the, to clean the toilet with a toothbrush, you'll go crazy. I kind of worked in that environment before. And I'm not even particularly creative. <laughs> But you should think about it when you are considering your employer. All right, getting back to here. We only got about three more minutes to go. There's a single pin on each chip that is labeled read-write because that is really important because it tells you know, the chip, the memory chip, whether I'm going to you know, specify a read operation or a write operation. Because if, if I'm initiating a read operation, then the chip has to drive the memory of the database. If I'm initiating a write operation, then I'm driving the, the, the data bus. So that's really important. And then there's a single chip select line on each chip. This is the only one that is not shared. Everything else are shared. In other words, you know, in this case, with four chips, with these four chips, when I specify a location, all four chips will get it all at the same time. When I specify you know, a data to write to a location on the data bus, all four chips will you know, actually get it. When I specify whether it's going to be a read or write operation, all four chips will get the same thing. The only time that only one chip will get only that portion is a chip select. In this case, it means you know this memory chip has one chip select line that connects to the processor directly. This chip has a separate chip select line that connects to the processor separately. So now I have four chip select lines each one going to each particular chip. Okay. And the chip select lines are typically labeled as CS, you know, which, which stands for C, the chip select. So we have <laughs> chip select zero, chip select one, chip select two, and then we have chip select three. Okay. So at this point, you know, I have just established the general architecture of you know how memory chips connect to each other as well as the processor. Next Tuesday, we'll move on and talk about memory um, operations. So let me just move to the next slide. I want to show you what, um, this is actually the same thing as what we talked about today. You know, it's just a little bit more structured. Um, I want you guys to at least read this part before the next uh, lecture is uh, section 2.3. It specifies, you know, what we call a memory write cycle as well as a memory read cycle. So you want to finish reading this part here We'll, we'll definitely get to that part in the next class. Uh, potentially go a little bit beyond that. We are going to room 126 right now. I have all the forms. Well, actually, I don't have enough forms. I have one, two, three, four, five. So I only got five petition <laughs> forms um, to add people. For those of you who are interested in moving you know, from one section, from the late section to the earlier section to help me up, uh, out, you know, uh, either send me an email or uh, we can meet up in room 126 right after this. Yeah. So 
So let me shut down the computer and we are going to room 126. Okay. Here's the sign-in sheet.